Okay, so today's lesson is going to be on quadrilaterals. This is going to be a little bit more difficult than most of the previous days we've looked at. It's really going to use a lot of different things that we've learned in the past and stick it all together to solve certain kinds of problems. Anyway, let's get started. So we're going to move away from triangles today and we're going to discuss, discuss quadrilaterals. Uh, if you're not sure what a quadrilateral is, I'll tell you in just a moment, but uh, the order of the things we're going to go through today are parallel lines and transversals. This is just going to be kind of a setup for some of the stuff. You'll be asked to do, of course, uh, not only in your homework, but also the notebooklet. Uh, we'll talk about properties of quadrilaterals, and then we'll solve geometry problems that involve quadrilaterals. This one's going to seem like a bit of a mixed bag today. There's going to be a bunch of different little things that come together. You're going to find that even though we're dealing with quadrilaterals, our understanding of triangles from the last class is still going to carry over. You'll have to just wait and see uh, why that is. Anyway, let's get rolling. So first of all, parallel lines and transversals. When a parallel line, or when parallel lines, sorry, more than one parallel line, are crossed by a transversal, which is just a line that crosses through both lines, both parallel lines, I should say, uh, several angles form. Find the measure of all missing angles. So uh, this is something that you would have first learned, I believe, back in Math 10-3. Uh, basically, what happens is you just have to look at an angle that's given to you, and then look at what relationships would exist from that angle to other angles that are around it. Now, if you look between angle one and angle two, they're on one flat line and there's a line that just kind of cuts it in half. Well, those two angles are called supplementary to one another. And when they're supplementary, that just basically means that they're gonna add up to 180 degrees because notice that this is a straight line uh, and a straight line has an angle of 180 degrees. So this piece being 75 means it needs to add to this piece to add up to 180. So what we can do to find angle one, I'll just go like this, angle one. Angle one is gonna be 180 minus the 75, which gives us 105 degrees. So we know 105 degrees is this angle right here. Next up, you can actually look between angle one and four. Notice they're technically on a straight line as well. That means they're gonna to have to add up to 180 degrees as well. And since they will, you can tell that the other angle will be 75 degrees. That comes into another rule that just kind of simplifies things. If you ever have a line that's crossed by a transversal, uh, the opposite angles to each other are going to be same, right? So in other words, 75 here and 75 here. As you could probably predict then, then angle three is going to be 105 degrees because it needs to be the same as that opposite angle there. Uh, but now the real question is, how do we jump from this whole little section to this section down here? Well, notice this angle that we were given in the first place, angle two of 75 degrees. It looks like it's pretty much the exact same thing as this. And a matter, as a matter of fact, because these two lines are parallel to one another, in other words, they'll never touch, uh, you can actually guarantee that those two uh, angles are actually the same. So we know this is 75 degrees. And then by the same logic we set up in the first ones, we can just finish the rest of these off. 105, 75, and 105 degrees. Okay, so you might be asked a few questions on these. Uh, it is just a review of Math 10-3, but there you go. All right, so into quadrilaterals now, which is the main focus for today. A quadrilateral is basically just a four-sided shape that's closed, right? And by closed, we mean all the lines closed together. There's no opening in it. It's a closed shape. Uh, so some of the properties of quadrilaterals include that the figure must be flat, or in other words, two-dimensional. Uh, there are four vertices, so four corners, in other words. Uh, and then another really, really big one, and this is really going to play into something important in the next lesson, uh, the sum of the interior angles is 360 degrees. Remember with triangles, it was only 180 degrees. Well, with quadrilaterals, just the additional side actually adds a full other 180 degrees to it to make it 360. Right uh, Now, quadrilaterals can take many different forms. You do need to know at least these six uh, main forms of quadrilaterals. Uh, the most basic ones are a rectangle, where you have all angles are 90 degrees, and the opposite sides are equal to each other in length. Right, So in a rectangle, these two sides would be the same length, and these two sides would be the same length. Uh, a square, that's probably the easiest one of them all. All the sides have to be the same, 90 degree angles in the corner. Rhombus is one that a lot of people often forget. A rhombus is basically just a square that someone sat on. Right, So all of the sides are equal uh, and opposite sides are parallel to each other. Um, but another important thing is all of the, yeah, all of the side lengths are equal, of course, right? The, what I'm trying to get at though is unlike a square, your angles don't have to be 90 degrees, um, but you are gonna see that the opposite angles will be the same uh, on this one as well. So notice that they color coded it green and green, and this one was red and red, that was done on purpose. Uh, next one is a parallelogram. A parallelogram is kind of like a rectangle that someone sat on, really. Uh, it's basically just where you still have parallel sides. So these two sides are parallel, these two sides are parallel, and they're not only just parallel, they're also equal. 
Uh, and then of course you got some angles that aren't 90 degrees in the corners. That makes it a parallelogram. Uh, next one's a trapezoid. This is an interesting picture they gave for a trapezoid because usually I think of trapezoids as being a little bit more uh, even, I guess I'd say. Usually I would draw a trapezoid as having your two parallel sides and then these two other sides, just do this as best I can, it's still not working out. The two other sides are about the same length. That doesn't actually have to make it a trapezoid, right? So a trapezoid just needs these two sides to be parallel. They don't have to even be the same length as it wouldn't be in this one. Uh, and the other two sides don't have to be the same length either. It just needs two parallel sides. That's it, right? Uh, the last one is a kite. I don't like this picture because I like to me, I think a kite should be the other way around. So if you look at this upside down, that's a better picture of a kite. Um, but basically a kite just says the adjacent pairs of sides are equal. So these two sides would be equal because they're right next to each other. And then the bottom or top in this case, two sides would also be equal, right? Um, these ones are actually pretty common. Uh, what's usually important about kites is uh, that there's like, you can break it down into a bunch of little triangles. This triangle that you'd form right here is gonna be the same as this triangle that you form there, just flipped around, right? Same idea, this triangle that you form here is gonna be the same as this triangle that forms here, right? So kites can be broken down into triangles and that makes it really useful uh, to solve them. Anyway, let's do a, a real quick example. Find measures of the missing angles and determine what kind of quadrilateral it is. Well, first of all, I think we can determine what kind of quadrilateral it is by looking at it. Notice how you have two parallel sides. Uh, and then these other two sides, it just means like with these little lines here, it just means that they're equal in length. But that's not actually super important on this one, um, at least for determining what kind of quadrilateral it is. Because just looking at this quadrilateral, I can determine that this is a trapezoid, okay? Uh, and this is exactly how I would usually think of a trapezoid, unlike the picture on the last slide, but still, this is a trapezoid. Uh, now, in terms of the angles, you can do this quite visually, but the fact that there's two parallel sides actually helps us. Remember when we just talked about parallel lines and transversals? Imagine that this line uh, continued uh, and that this line right here was actually a transversal. Since we could consider that a transversal, it's almost like we would say that this angle and this angle would be the same. So it would be like 118 degrees over here. But if it's 118 degrees here, notice it's supplementary to angle S, which means they're gonna add up to 180. So I could say S or angle S is going to equal 180 minus 118, which should give us 62 degrees. So we know this angle is 62 degrees. Now, uh, I guess another thing we could say with this is because these two sides are equal in length, uh, we know that they have to actually connect pretty much at the same length point as the other ones. So we can make a reasoned adjust or assumption here that if this angle is 118 degrees, this angle right here would also be 118 degrees. And since this is 118 degrees, we could also say this is 118 degrees, uh, and then therefore this would be 62 degrees. So again, these kind of questions are just more or less a little bit of a puzzle trying to figure out how the original angle that they gave you is gonna connect with all of the other angles that are in your shape, okay? Just think critically about where those angles are going to go and what angles would be equal to each other and which ones wouldn't, okay? All right, moving on. Leslie is building a planter for her front porch. At what angle does she need to cut angle A? Well, let's have a look at the picture. Angle A, of course, is this angle down here. Um, now, if we wanna know what angle she needs to cut that at, we're gonna to need to know some information uh, about the shape itself. Now, the bottom line is with quadrilaterals, it's often most useful to try to break it down into any triangles you can. And this picture actually has kind of done it for us. Notice how the planter kind of slopes down and then it reaches a point where it's reaching the bottom. And they drew a, like a dashed line directly straight up from where it connects the bottom to where uh, the equivalent place would be at the top. And they even labeled how long those sides are. So if I'm gonna take this like really skinny triangle here and bring it out to make it a little bit bigger, there we go. We could say that there's a right angle right here. This is the angle A that we're looking for. And we know this top side is 2.5 centimeters. And this uh, long side right here is 30 centimeters. Well, how can we find angle A? We already know a couple of the side lengths here. We would have to actually use a little bit of trigonometry to find this, right? So trigonometry would say in order to find angle A, we have to be using the other sides that we know. Well, relative to angle A, 30 is the opposite side and 2.5 would be the adjacent side. So we have the opposite and we have the adjacent. If you think of SOHCAHTOA to determine whether you're using sine, cos, and tan, 
uh, since we're dealing with opposite and adjacent, the only one that has both opposite and adjacent in it would be 10. So we could say that 10 of A is equal to the opposite side, which is 30, divided by the adjacent side, which is 2.5. Now remember, we want to find angle A, so we have to get rid of 10. And in order to get rid of 10, we have to take the inverse 10 of both sides. So A is going to equal the inverse 10 of 30 divided by 2.5. Make sure you're in degree mode when you do this. I'll plug it into my calculator real quick right now. Inverse 10 of 30 divided by 2.5 is going to equal, and we'll just round to the nearest whole angle. Uh, A is going to equal, it's a pretty, pretty big angle actually, 85 degrees, okay? So in other words, Leslie would have to cut that angle at 85 degrees in order to make it uh, as per the dimensions that she wants. Next one, how much soil in centimeters cubed can the planter hold? All right, so really what it's saying, because especially since it says centimeters cubed, it's really asking for a volume. We're looking for the volume of this planter. Now, volume is useless unless you have a formula. So this is where I'm gonna tell you, have a look at your formula sheet. I'm gonna pull it out right now. Um, on your formula sheet on the back side, there's a formula that says just the general volume of a prism. So volume of prism. And it says V is equal to area of the base times by the height. And on your formula sheet, it actually even shows like an example of a prism. It's just a triangle of a prism where there's a triangle here and then it goes and then there's like a triangle on the back kind of thing. This right here, like your main shape on the front of your prism, that's your base. Okay. And then the length of your prism is actually known as your height. Okay. So if we're gonna apply this to find the volume of this planter, we would need to find the area of our base, which is this trapezoid on the front, and then multiply by the height, which is this 1.5 meters that they gave us. But that brings up a new problem. How on earth can we find the area of a trapezoid? Well, also, if you're looking at your formula sheet right now, right above where it says volume of a prism on the back backside, uh, it shows a trapezoid and it tells what the formula would be for the area of a trapezoid. Uh, for the area of a trapezoid, it's one half A plus B H. Now you'll need the picture to determine what all that means. It shows a picture of a trapezoid on your formula sheet. That was a horrible, but hopefully you're getting the idea. Um, and what it says is A is this side, B is this side, and then H is this. So in other words, H would be how tall your trapezoid would be. Not to be confused with this H. It's kind of silly how your formula sheet uh, does this, of course, but uh, I hope you get the idea. This H is not the same as this H. So you know, I'll call this like HT for trapezoid and then HP for H prism, right? So anyway, just carry, carry on with that. Let's throw our numbers in though. A is going to equal one half times little a, so the length of the bottom side of our trapezoid. Well, the bottom side of our trapezoid here would be the 40 centimeters. So 40 plus B, which is the shorter side of our trapezoid, that would be 35. And then we need to multiply that by the height of our trapezoid, which is also given to us, that's 30. So I'll throw this in my calculator real quick. It's just a bunch of things multiplied together. So A is going to, going to equal 1 half times 40 plus 35, which is 75. So you just throw 75 in your calculator if you wanted to, times by 30. And that gives me an area of 1,125. And since that's centimeters and centimeters, you could say that's centimeters squared. Uh, and then we can jump back to our volume uh, formula. Remember the volume formula says area of the base times the height of the prism. So we know the area of the base now. So we can say volume is equal to 1,125 times by the height of the prism, which is 1.5. So if I multiply that now by 1.5, we're going to get the volume is equal to 1,687.5. And because that was centimeters squared times centimeters, that gives us centimeters cubed. That was a hard one, but I gave this one on purpose because I want you to realize that on your formula sheet, you can find all of the formulas for the areas of all of these quadrilaterals, as well as the, uh, the volume formula, right? So make sure you're checking your formula sheet. If you ever get to a question where you're like, what on earth? Uh, it's probably on your formula sheet. Your formula sheet is very useful for you. All right, next one. This is one of our last questions here. Ian is making a kite for the Windscape Kite Festival in Swift Current, Saskatchewan. What are the measures of angle BCE and angle CBE? What kind of triangle is BEC? Okay, let's start with like one step at a time here. Angle BCE. 
BCE, that's referring to this angle right here. So we want to find the value of this angle right here in the corner. Um, now we're going to need to know some side lengths. This is where we're going to have to be really creative with the side lengths that it gave us here. Notice it told us that this section is 40 centimeters. If we're going to apply it to the triangles that we see in this kite, we can say that this is 40. Um, and then of course, if we're finding C, we need either this side or this side. But notice down here at the bottom, it says 80 centimeters is from here to here. So since 80 centimeters is from here to here, and it's a kite, which is usually you know, developed evenly, we can therefore deduce that this side is also 40, right? Because it's one half of the full 80. Now, if we're looking for C, we can use a little bit of trigonometry here. Uh, if you're pretty keen, you could actually see that you don't need to use trigonometry. It's going to be a very interesting angle that C is given uh, on this one. Uh, but if you don't see it, that's totally fine. We can use trigonometry to find this out. Notice that compared to C, 40 is our opposite side. And this other uh, 40 here is our adjacent side. Well, just like before, opposite and adjacent from so ka toa opposite and adjacent are going to be used for tan. So we're going to say tan of C is equal to opposite, which is 40, divided by adjacent, which is 40. We want to get C all by itself, so let's take the inverse tan of 40 over 40. 40 over 40, of course, is just one, but whatever. Uh, if you take the inverse tan of this, you're actually going to get your angle to be 45 degrees right on the nose. Okay, so 45 degrees is the measure of that. I better write it uh, more explicitly. So angle B, C, E is equal to 45 degrees. There we go. Uh, now it's also asking for angle C, B, E. Angle C, B, E is referring to this angle in the corner here. We don't have to use any advanced trig to figure this one out. Uh, if you wanted to, you could realize that the opposite side is this 40 and the adjacent side is this 40. So you have the exact same setup as before. Or you could realize that inside of a triangle, all of the angles add up to 180 degrees. So you could go 180 minus this 90 and then minus 45. Either way you slice and dice it though, angle C and B, C, B, E is going to equal another 45 degrees. So to answer this last question, what kind of triangle, woo, what kind of triangle is B, E, C? So B, E, C, the triangle we've been focusing on, what kind of triangle is it? Uh, well, it really depends on uh, whether you want to list it by side length or by angle measure. If you did it by angle measure, which is how I probably would do it, well, you know what, maybe, maybe not even. Uh, but angle measure, either way, you would call it an acute triangle. Um, and then side length. Side length is actually just as, as interesting on this one, if not even more, now that I'm thinking about it. In terms of side length, notice that two sides are the same length. The hypotenuse will not be the same length here. It's not going to be an equilateral triangle. It's just not going to happen, right? So for side length, since two sides are equal, that's called an isosceles triangle, right? So depending on what your perspective is, on what kind of triangle it is, um, whether you look at it from an angle perspective or a side perspective, it's either an acute triangle or an isosceles triangle. All right, last question building on this. What are the measures of angle EAD? EAD, that would be this angle right here. Uh, and ECD, ECD is this angle right here. Let's focus on EAD first. Uh, this can be done very similar to the one uh, we just did before. We just gotta figure out our side lengths. Once again, notice 80 is how wide this is, so we know that this is a 40 for the same logic that we had for the other one. Uh, and then we actually know this side too. It's given to us explicitly, it's 70 centimeters right there. So this side right here is 70. Uh, we now have an opposite and an adjacent. Once again, opposite and adjacent seems to be the theme today. We're going to be using tan. So tan of A is equal to opposite, which is 70, over adjacent, which is 40. Take the inverse tan of both sides. So A is going to equal the inverse tan of 70 over 40. Uh, and then the inverse tan of 70 over 40. Definitely going to need a calculator on this one. Uh, and I'll round, you know what, I'll round to the nearest whole, whole degree. It's not a perfect number here, but I'll round. A is going to equal. 60 degrees, or in other words, how they would probably want it, angle EAD is equal to 60 degrees. All right, now we have to do the same with angle ECD, so this angle up here in the corner. Notice once again, the opposite side is 70, and the adjacent side is 40. Well, wait a minute, they got the exact same opposite and adjacent. Since it's opposite and adjacent, once again, you're gonna be using 10, but it's the exact same ratio, so we can skip all of that and just say ECD, is going to equal 60 degrees as well. Cool, anyway, so that's how these questions work with kites. 
just break it down, make sure you label the side lengths. Uh, notice that with quadrilaterals, four-sided shapes, we often just break it down into triangles anyway. That's usually the easiest way to, to work with these, right? So for practice, I want you to do page 191 to 202. Uh, just a heads up, for any questions that tell you to use a protractor, just skip them if you don't have one. Like if you do have a protractor handy, go for it. But if there's any questions that are like, oh, you know, use a protractor to measure these angles, don't worry about it. It's not really the end of the world and it's not the most important thing we're dealing with here. Uh, most questions on this can be done logically, like the ones we've done in this lesson. So in other words, just by observing the whole situation. Uh, so usually that is a way around it, but if it explicitly told you to use a protractor, just skip those questions. Uh, the homework booklet is due on Friday. Uh, Friday's class, just like last week for the Thursday lesson, uh, Friday's class is going to be a work block to give you just some time to catch up, right? So in other words, uh, there's been a lot of practice questions I've been assigning. Uh, you can catch up on that Friday. Anyway, as always, if you have any questions, send me an email, contact me on Google Classroom, whatever you need to do. Best of luck.